the boastful thugs of Abu Sayyaf, the ones who kidnapped and killed Canadians Robert Hall and John Ridstill, have never been able to restrain themselves from taking pictures. What's your cooperation? Some still on the run from the Philippine military clearly act with impunity. This man has. He's known by several names, including Ben Tattoo, and he was the executioner. So there he's, he's taking a picture of him himself, a selfie in the jungles in the Philippines. And the angle of the photo, the angle of his face, it matched perfectly to one of the execution videos. Quietly for two years now, a Canadian intelligence analyst acting independently has been tracking the on-again, off-again social media accounts of Ben Tattoo, who's clearly making it known he's now affiliated with ISIS. So as you scroll through... Like in his search, Jeff Wire says he spotted something startling. This, a picture of Ben Tattoo in police uniform. He's posted it a few times, most recently with the Never Surrender taunt. I think he's been a cop. And that has a whole other dimension for uh, the investigation and the reason why he's been able to evade both the Philippine National Police and the military for years. In other words, the uniform of the police units that hunt Abu Sayyaf. Stolen uniforms or uniforms sold on the black market have been a problem in the Philippines, but Wires says he sees other indications Tattoo may have been a real member of the force. Look at his name on the ammunition, for example. It verifies also his identity. He's labeled the grenades because he's responsible for them. Wires is also curious about an image behind Ben Tattoo that he says looks like fleet vehicle keys, the way police and military carry them. CBC News has gone through Ben Tattoo's most recent Facebook page and has found connections, friends, who are also police officers. This doesn't necessarily prove anything, but the implication is damning. It suggests one of the most wanted men in the Philippines at one point was trained in a counterinsurgency unit, learned all the skills he'd need to evade capture. Did he flip sides at one point? Was he both cop and Abu Sayyaf terrorist at the same time? Neither the Philippine police nor military have answered our questions, but it would be wrong to suggest they aren't trying to find him. Just a year after Hall and Ridsdale were killed, we sat down with the commander of the unit that had tried to rescue the Canadians and other hostages. And the man who beheaded the two Canadians, what's happened to him? Many people involved in the beheadings that already died due to combat operations. I can assure you that. But the leaders, we are trying to get them also. Because leaders are mostly the, the hardest part to crack because they have many defenses. And deadly. The military gave us these photos it claimed are some of the Filipino casualties of all those efforts. How many soldiers did you lose trying to rescue the Canadians? Well, what I can say is that I'll give you a range. That's from 30, uh, 30 to 35. Um, that range... Uh, from different time operations. They lost their lives uh, trying to rescue the kidnapped victims, the Canadian kidnapped victims. Always, Abu Sayyaf were one step ahead. It's often the way. They've learned to navigate and own the jungles as well as some of the local populations. But is it possible Ben Tattoo had the right training to keep soldiers at bay? The stories about the attempted rescues are verified by one of the only people who really knows what happened. Tess Floor. She was Robert Hall's girlfriend. Sometimes uh, I regret because I, I, I was thinking that I did my best because I, I always I did lots of things to, to help Robert, to save Robert's life, but it's not working. She told us she remembers hearing the bullets flying. She and Hall could hear the soldiers were desperate to be saved. Sometimes we felt scared, of course, and sometimes we, after, after that fight, we, we said, you know, it's frustrating because we are still here. Tess would try to negotiate with the kidnappers as the only person who could speak with them. She even tried talking to Ben Tattoo's wife. I talked to the wife of the guy who did a beheading. I talked to her that please, can you please talk to your husband? Because of course he is our leader. 
can you please talk to him that this money that they were asking it's ridiculous she also told me okay 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 ate, I will I will talk to him I will talk to him but I, I didn't trust them Canada does not and will not pay ransom to terrorists Canada's position was clear and the hostages understood that but still hoped their government would somehow help save them after they were killed Another country eventually intervened and Tess and a Norwegian hostage were released, a ransom paid. It was seeing her tell her tale that Jeff Wires says started him on the path of looking for more information, just trying to help. I think the families feel like they've been ignored from the start um, in the investigation uh, by their government um, and to a certain extent by Canadians. We want them to know that that's not the case, that Canadians do care. But to dig around like this isn't comfortable for anyone. One person close to the families called the report damning. Another is angry. The research is coming out at a time that's hard enough as it is. It's not known what will come of this, but in the work there are warnings. Ben Tattoo is on the loose and getting bolder, his history becoming clearer. Wires believes he can trace him to the kidnapping of a German couple years before the Canadians were taken. He's right there. You can tell by his uh, little brow there. The biggest issue in this investigation has been transparency. So even in this, the disclosures by the Philippine government to our own government, um, there's never been that level of transparency that I think both Canadians expect and uh, the victims' families expect. It's not just transparency. Canadians allowed themselves to hope for answers, too. Arguably, they don't have either.